Hello, everyone. Welcome to session 12 of our course. Today we are talking about Bada Kapilani, who is the nun who is foremost in um, recollection of past lives, and she's also Maha Kasapa's wife. Um, before we start, I have to let you know I just got my second Pfizer shot a few days ago, and I'm still feeling very boozy. So we'll see how it goes today. Um, and so uh, Bata Kapilani uh, is a very interesting character. Uh, uh, first of all, because of course she is Mahakasapa's wife, and we have seen that Mahakasapa uh, he had quite misogynistic views. We saw that when we uh, read in our first session, when we read the account of the first council, he um, he or his supporters, his group. Uh, had quite strong opinions about the inferiority of women. They were quite opposed to bhikkhuni ordination. Uh, but then he has a wife and a wife who is a bhikkhuni and one of the foremost bhikkhunis. So it's quite an interesting combination. And then also, of course, uh, in some ways, um, Mahakasapa and Bada uh, are somewhat, uh, somewhat comparable to the Buddha and Yashodara uh, because they're also uh, one of the foremost couples and of course, um, uh, yeah, um, in some ways, Kasapa is the successor of the Buddha in an informal way. He took charge of the Sangha when the Buddha had passed away. He was the one who convened the first council, who presided over the first council, uh, who was then in control of the text. So um, um, uh, it's kind of interesting to compare this couple with uh, the Buddha and Yasodhara. So this is what we're going to do today. And before we start, we will chant the Namo Tassa as usual, and feel free to join me if you'd like to um, chant along. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sankhang Namasami So I will share my screen and then we can that right away. So today we are going to look at uh, the only early source we have about Bata Kapilani, which is her Thirigata poem, Thirigata 4.1. Uh, then we are going to look at her Apadani, Apadana in the Pali, uh, Pali text, Pali uh, school, uh, which has very strong links to the Thirigata poem, but which sort of develops the tendencies that we see in the poem in a very unique way, very unusual way. And then uh, we are going to have a look at the Vinya text. So Bada is someone who appears very frequently in the Vinya text. Um, and there is a very distinct difference in the way she's presented in the Pali Bikuni Vinya and in the way she's presented in every other Vinya, every non-Pali Vinya, including the Sanskrit and the Chinese versions. Uh, and I think there are probably some things we can um, uh, draw out by, by comparing these two versions. And um, yeah, so this is what we're going to do today. And as I just mentioned, Bada in all the sources, both in the Pali and in the Chinese uh, sources, is the nun who is foremost in recollection of past lives. And also in all the schools, she is presented as Mahakasapa's wife. So all schools um, present the idea that uh, she and Kasapa uh, were, were a married couple. Um, so here is her poem. Um, and it goes as follows. Kasapa is the son and heir of the Buddha, whose mind is immersed in Samadhi. He knows his past lives and sees heaven and places of loss and has attained the end of rebirth. That sage has perfect insight. It's because of these three knowledges that the Brahmin is a master of the three knowledges. 
In exactly the same way, Bada Kapilani is a master of the three knowledges, destroyer of death. She bears her final body, having vanquished Mara and his mount. Seeing the danger of the world, both of us went forth. Now we are tamed, our defilements have ended, we've become cooled and quenched. So this is a very unusual poem. Um, we can see the first two stanzas here. Uh, don't talk about Bada at all, they only talk about Maha Kasapa. Um, this is very unusual for the Terigata. In the Terigata, it's very, very rare that the nuns talk about the monks. Except for the Buddha himself, uh, I think monks very, very rarely appear in the Terigata. I remember one uh, poem where a uh, bhikkhuni admonishes and teaches a bhikkhu, uh, who is her son. So this is Vadamata's poem, who is, and Vadamata is teaching Vata, who is also a bhikkhu. And then by the teaching of his mother, he's able to attain arahanship. And um, I remember another poem where a nun, when she was a lay person, received a teaching from a bhikkhu. And then because of that teaching, I think she became a nun. Um, but other than that, it's extremely rare that a bhikkhu would appear in the Terigata. And we really get the impression that the ancient bhikkhunis were quite separate as a sangha from the bhikkhu sangha. And, but here, this is really one poem that stands out because uh, a bhikkhu is praised so much. Um, and uh, so again, we, we, it seems like Bada still has a very strong connection, even though both of them have gone forth and they are no longer to be considered married or a family, she still has a very strong connection to her former husband, to Mahakasapa. And it has often been pointed out that this is a rhetorical device that Bada uses to her advantage um, because um, Kasapa is one of the foremost monks. He's extremely popular. So she starts her poem by praising him and that creates an emotional connection with her audience. And everybody thinks, oh, this woman says very smart things. She is praising this, uh, this amazing monk. Uh, and then she twists it around and says, I am exactly as powerful as this foremost monk, as this amazing monk. So because she says, in exactly the same way, I am a master of the three knowledges. So this is a way of um, making a very strong statement as that as a woman, she is able to be as powerful as, the most, uh, as one of the most powerful monks. So here uh, she is praising a monk and it seems a little bit over the top maybe, but she's just using it to get the point across that as a woman, she's able to attain the exact same thing. Um, and then the last stanza, um, she says, seeing the danger of the world, both of us went forth. So here she lets us know that they went forth together and they went forth uh, um, because they, uh, especially both of them, including her, um, had a very genuine spiritual vocation. So she didn't go forth because her husband went forth and she felt lonely at home, but she really went forth because she wanted to to attain the end of rebirth because she saw the, the disadvantages of uh, living in samsara. And uh, I think many people will be familiar with the story of the commentarial story of um, Bada and uh, Mahakasapa going forth. This is again a very popular story found in many of the schools, not only in the Pali version. Uh, and um, in, in that story, we know that uh, Bada and Mahakasapa, they were both from Brahmin families. And both of them, even when they were very young, had uh, the wish to go forth and not to get married. So when the parents um, set up the marriage, both of them sent letters to each other, asking each other not to get married and to find another husband or wife, another partner, um, because uh, they wanted to go forth. But the parents were really adamant that they get married. So they intercepted the letter and exchanged them with love letters. And so they ended up getting married, but they never consummated the marriage and they lived together as brother and sister. Um, and when the parents had passed away, they were free to go forth. And they went forth together. And, um, but then they parted ways um, because they thought it was unsuitable for a man and a woman to be together when they are ascetics. And uh, they went forth in the first year of the Buddha's dispensation. So when the Buddha had just started teaching at the first opportunity that they had uh, to get the true Dhamma. So their karma was very strong. 
And Mahakasapa immediately encountered the Buddha and uh, became a monk and became an arahant. What happened to Bada is a little bit different in the different schools. According to the Pali school, um, she had to stay in a non-Buddhist uh, residence for female monastics. Um, so she stayed with non-Buddhist renunciants um, for five years until uh, Mahapajapati came along and started a bhikkhuni order. And then when the bhikkhuni order had been founded, she became a bhikkhuni and became fully enlightened. Uh, according to other sources, especially I think in the Mula Savasivada tradition or the Savasivada tradition, um, that doesn't happen to her. She encounters the Buddha and she gets ordained with an Ehi Bhikkhuni ordination. So um, Ehi Bhikkhuni ordination, we've talked about this before when we talked about Bada Kundala Kesa is the ordination where the Buddha says, come Bhikkhuni, and then she automatically gets ordained in that way. So that would make Bata Kapilani obviously a very, very early bhikkhuni, uh, much earlier than the story of Mahapajapati. And so Bada is one of the, the candidates uh, um, that we think could have been the first bhikkhuni or one of the first bhikkhunis who uh, like might, might be an alternative to, to, Mah to Mahapajapati founding the bhikkhuni order because we have stories, not in the Pali tradition, but in, in the Savasivada or Mula Savasivada tradition. So um, this is her early um, poem. She, um, she is quite a strong woman. She declares, she's a bold woman. She declares her arahanship in a very strong, unequivocal way. She makes it clear that she had a genuine spiritual vocation. Um, but also she, 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 she shows her connection to Mahakasapa, which is still very strong. And uh, especially this connection with Mahakasapa is now developed in a very strong way in her Apadana and also in a very unusual way in her Apadana. So um, we are going to have a look at that now. Um, and the Apadana as usual starts in the time of uh, Padumuttara Buddha, um, and the Apadana is also very long, so we are going to skip a few passages. And it begins as follows. The victor Padumutada was one with eyes for everything. That leader of the world was born 100,000 eons hence. There was then in Hangsavati a leader known as Videha, a millionaire with many gems. I was the wife of him back then. So that leader, that millionaire is obviously Kasapa in a former life. Once accompanied by servants, he went up to the human sun and listened to the Buddha's teaching, causing all suffering to end. The leader praised the follower who was top in austerities. Hearing he, he is the millionaire, gave alms for a week to the Buddha, the neutral one. Um, bowing his head at Buddha's feet, he aspired to that foremost place, causing his retinue to smile. Right then that bull among people, Having pitied the millionaire, spoke these verses aloud to him. You will attain the wished for state. O son, you'll achieve nirvana. In 100,000 eons, arising in Okaka's clan, the one whose name is Gotama, will be the teacher in the world. Were the heir of that one's Dhamma, Dhamma's legitimate offspring, the one whose name is Kaspa, will be the teacher's follower. So... Here we have Kasapa uh, in a former life, being a millionaire. He goes to the, to the, the Buddha Patamutara. He sees that another disciple, uh, another bhikkhu, is the foremost in ascetic practices, and he aspires to, to become someone like this in a future life. And his retinue smiles, obviously because he's a millionaire and he's very much indulgent in sense pleasures, and he's the opposite of an austere ascetic practitioner. Uh, but still, the Buddha gives him the confirmation uh, that he will attain this place. And then, um, gladdened after hearing that, as long as he lived, he then served with requisites the victor guide with a heart that was full of love, lighting up the dispensation, crushing the dirty heretics, instructing those who could be taught. He passed on with his, his followers. So the Buddha passed on, not the millionaire. Uh, and when that world chief reached Nirvana, assembling his kinsmen and friends to do puja to the teacher, with them he then had constructed a stupa. So the millionaire constructed the stupa, which was made of gems rising up seven leagues in height. 
So one leak, it's not quite clear how, how long a leak is. Some people estimate it's roughly 10 kilometers. Uh, so we're not quite sure, but that's a rough like ballpark figure. So seven leaks is very high. Obviously an exaggeration. With, uh, which blazed forth just as does the sun, like a re uh, regal saw tree in bloom. And now we have a very long description of how amazing that stupa was full of gems and full of perfumes and um, um, banners and, and ornaments and um, lots of other things. And then having performed puja like that, lovely for the excellent one, he gave the monks community arms as much as he could his whole life. So we are now on page three of this apadana and this is Bada's apadana. But the only person who is being talked about so far is Maha Kasapa, uh, which is obviously remarkable. This doesn't happen in any other Apadana of any other of the foremost nuns. Uh, and it's always Kasapa who is going to the Buddha, Kasapa who is making merit, Kasapa who is uh, building up that stupa. And it's also very remarkable that it is Kasapa who gets the prediction of being a future foremost disciple of the Buddha Gautama when rightfully this should be Bada who should be getting that prediction because Bada is also a foremost nun. Bada is the one foremost in recollect recollecting past lives. So this is what her Abadana should be about. This is what we see in any other Abadana of any other of the foremost nuns. They get a prediction, but here Bada does not get a prediction. Only Mahakasapa is the one who gets the prediction. So now finally she appears and the, the stanza says, Along with that millionaire, I, as long as I lived, also did those marriage-filled deeds thoroughly, and with him I had good rebirth. So she's basically just an afterthought to everything that Kasapa did, uh, Kasapa does. So Kasapa does, and she kind of follows along. Um, and she has to do that because, just like the Buddha and Yashodara, in the Pali tradition, um, Kasapa and Bada are also a couple whose fate was intertwined for many, many, many eons and who had rebirths together. So of course, to have rebirths together, she needs to have the same marriage that Kasava has. Um, so she kind of tags along and sort of does the same things, but she has no agency of her own. She is just following uh, the man. And then she says, experiencing happiness, both as a human and a god, I was reborn along with him like a shadow with the body. So obviously Kasapa is the body, she's just the shadow. She doesn't have an existence of her own, basically. She's just following the man. So this is very different from her, from, from her early poem, where she used the praise of Kasapa um, as a rhetorical device to make a bold statement about the abilities of women. But here that is turned around and everything is focused on Kasapa. Uh, and this is not to state the, the um, the abilities of women, but to kind of really make the woman just uh, as a sort of like an appendix to, uh, to the man, like a little thingy that follows along. Mm, and then the next Buddha arises, uh, Buddha Vipassi, the leader known as Vipassi arose 91 years ago, Buddha delightful to the eye, one with insight into all things. Then he lived in Bandumati, a Brahmin known for excellence. So of course, this is Katsapa again, rich in scripture and religion, but very poor in terms of wealth. And at that time of the same mind, I was his Brahmin woman wife. Once that excellent twice born man met with the sage who was so great, seated amidst the population, preaching the state of deathlessness. Hearing the Dhamma overjoyed, he gave his own cloak to that sage. Going home in a single cloth, he spoke these words to me just then, take joy in this great good karma, the cloak given to the Buddha. Then clasping hands together, I, well satisfied, did take the light. Husband, this cloak is gifted well to the best Buddha, neutral one. So again, it is Kasapa who meets Buddha Vipassi. It is Kasapa who makes the offering and she is staying at home and she is sort of just doing the rejoicing. Again, she's not the one acting. And then there's another rebirth. Uh, he is reborn as, we are like skipping a little bit ahead now. She is reborn as a king. She is his chief queen. And there were uh, eight Pacheka Buddhas and he's giving a big 
uh, cost the arms. Of course, he is giving the arms. He is making a pavilion. Um, he is offering, um, and she uh, also follows along. And then there's a new rebirth. rebirth. Um, now, this is an interesting rebirth here uh, because this time she's not Mahakasapa's wife. So she says, again, I was reborn in a village outside the Kasi Gate. He was happy with his brothers. In a wealthy clan of families, I was the eldest brother's wife, a woman who fulfilled her vows. So she is the older brother's wife and Kasapa is the younger brother. Having seen a lonely Buddha, a lonely Buddha is a Pacheka Buddha. He who was my younger brother, so Kasapa, gave his portion to that Buddha. When he arrived, I told him that. So Kasapa is giving alms to the Pacheka Buddha. And when her husband, the older brother arrived, she told the husband. Um, and the husband did not praise that alms giving. So having taken back the food from Buddha, I gave it to him. So she takes the arms back from the Buddha and gives it to the husband. And then again, he gave it to him, him, gave him it himself. So the husband then gives the arms to the Buddha. Back, so he gives it back to the Buddha. Um, and then she gets angry because of this back and forth. Then having thrown away that food, enraged, I took back Buddha's bowl. A second time, filled it with mud and gave it to that neutral one. So she grabs back the food because now she's angry and fills up the bowl with mud. And right when he received those arms, rotten and lacking purity, his mind was equally happy, seeing that I was very moved. So the Buddha uh, didn't show any reaction to that. And again, I took that bowl from him and cleaned it with scented perfume with my mind. Then full of pleasure, I gave him ghee respectfully. So then she, um, she regrets what she did and she gives him uh, a proper arms offering. And then in whichever place I'm reborn because I gave arms, I'm gorgeous. Through giving Buddha tasteless food, my breath has a horrible stench. So for the first time here, we see Bada acting of her own accord, um, not following her husband or not following the brother or whoever Kasapa is in this, in this uh, story, um, but um, making her own decision. But finally, when she makes her own decision, she makes a wrong decision. So she offers mud to a Buddha. She gets angry with a Buddha and she offers mud to a Buddha. So she's making bad karma. So again, this shows us here in this story, uh, for the woman, it's better to tag along with the husband and not to have her own agency and not to uh, act in her own way, but uh, to, um, because when she does, then she makes a wrong decision and she makes a lot of bad karma. And um, of course, this is extremely different from what we've seen last week when we compared Yasodara's Apadana, when we read Yasodara's Apadana. And of course, Yasodara and the Buddha had a very, very different relationship. Uh, we saw um, how much they were uh, shown to be equals, how much they were shown to be real partners, and uh, how much Yasodara had her own agency and did her own actions and made her own merit. So we, we maybe maybe you remember there were those long lists of um, of all the various meritorious deeds that Yashodara did, and uh, the way she was presenting that in the Apadana was that she went up to the Buddha and she listed all these long um, these extensive um, actions that she had done, and she was calling the Buddha to witness that. So she was acting, and the Buddha was bearing witness. So she was the active one and the Buddha was the passive one. It, uh, and she was also very independent from the Buddha. She made her own decisions, her own merit. And the Buddha um, sort of only witnessed, he might not even have been present at that time. So it's very, very different. Their relationship uh, is very, very different. It's much, much more equal than that between Bada and Kasapa. And uh, one theory that has sometimes put, been put forward um, to explain that is that, um, of course, uh, the Buddha and Yashodara came from the Katya clan, the warrior clan, um, whereas Bada and um, Kasapa came from a Brahmin clan. And uh, we know that the situation of women 
changed after the Buddha's time, but it might not have changed in all um, classes of society in the same way. So it's very likely that this started in the Bra uh, for the Brahmins first, so that uh, for the Brahmins uh, first, the status of women declined quite rapidly, quite quickly, and that in other groups of society, the other case, um, things would have remained equal much longer. So for that reason, it's, uh, it seems that for, for Brahmins, an ideal marriage would be a very domineering uh, male personality with a very submissive female personality. Uh, whereas for the Katyas, a much more equal relationship was seen as an ideal marriage. So that is one possible explanation why um, those two couples are portrayed in such a different way, even though both of them are quite respected couples and the tradition certainly didn't want to put anyone down here. Certainly they wanted to tell an inspiring story, uh, not um, a story that is detrimental to their characters. So here we might see an example how the different uh, castes, the different classes in society had very different approaches towards women. Um, so, and then the story continues. Uh, then um, uh, there's Kasapa Buddha and his stupa was being completed. And she, when the stupa was being made, she donates a tile and then she applies a scented uh, perfumes to that tile so that that horrible stench um, uh, goes away eventually. And so she gives a lot of offerings there. Um, and then uh, the story kind of picks up. Um, we are skipping ahead a little bit again. Um, again, um, there is Sumita, a well-known sage, and she's the wife, and they give, and he gives to lonely Buddhas, and she shares that marriage. Then he is reborn as a Kulian, and he again uh, um, attends upon Pacheka Buddhas, 500 Pacheka Buddhas, uh, with all kinds of arms, and she follows along. Then he becomes the King Nanda, and she becomes the chief queen, and then he becomes King Brahmadatta, and he did all sorts of um, um, meritorious action towards Pacheka Buddhas, another 500 Pacheka Buddhas, and she too tags along. Um, and then finally, now we come to the last life. So they were reborn both in the Brahma world and then fallen down to Mahatita. He is well-born Pipalayana. So Pipali is another name for Kasapa. And his mother was Sumana Devi and his father was the Brahmin Kosigota. And in the mother country, I was daughter of Brahmin Kapila. Mother was Suchimati in Sagala, the best of cities. And my father, having adorned me with a thick golden ornament, gave me to the wise Kasapa who would avoided desire for me. So this is now the story that we also see in the commentaries, which I've told in the beginning. The two of them get married, even though they don't really want to. But in her Apadana story, it's only Kasapa who has avoided desire for her. It's not stated that she also avoided desire for him, so that the relationship was kind of mutual. Um, they had the same aspirations, the same ideas. But in, here in this um, Apadana story, it's again just told from Kasapa's perspective. Um, and then one time that compassionate man gone forth wishing for karma's end was moved at seeing some creatures devoured by crows, by crows and such like birds. So here he, he hasn't gone forth into homelessness yet. He's just gone out or like he's just gone for a walk. Um, he's still a lay person. And then she, she too, in the house was moved seeing worms that had been born in sesame then baked by sun heat being eaten up by some crows. Uh, when the wise Kasapa had renounced, I followed him in renouncing. For five years, I resided then along the path of renounces. So here, uh, again, unlike in her poem, uh, in her poem, they go forth together. Here, Kasapa goes forth, forth first, and she follows him. Um, and uh, of course, this uh, belongs to the Pali tradition. So she doesn't get ordained with Ihi Bikuni. Uh, she has to stay for five years with non-Buddhist ascetics, female ascetics, before she can ordain, uh, because she has to wait for Mahapajapati to come. 
and start the uh, female Sangha. So when Gotami, the victor's nurse, had gone forth as a renouncer, then come together with Buddha, I too received his instructions. So finally, after five years, she also becomes a bhikkhuni. After not a very long time, I achieved the Arahant state, oh, being the beautiful friend of the resplendent Kasapa. So again, she uh, celebrates her Arahantship, but the way she celebrates is that now she is finally uh, a beautiful friend to Kasapa. So she celebrates her own Arahantship as something that boosts sort of Kasapa's standing in the Sangha because now his wife uh, has also uh, attained. And now here, the next four stanzas is a repetition of her poem, her Terigata poem. This is uh, an exact quote, so we don't have to go through that again. Um, and then the last three here are just uh, stock passages. We see that in many of the Apadanas. This is a celebration of her powers, a celebration of her Arahantship. So here, uh, as you can see, her apadana is very unusual in that it doesn't really focus on Bada. It really, really focuses only on Mahakasapa mainly. And she is very much seen as a, like, as she describes herself, as a shadow to the body. She's very much just seen as the shadow. Um, so this is very unusual. Um, on the other hand, this. Um, is something that um, th this, um, this idea that uh, Brahmin relationships or Brahmin marriages were quite different from um, Hatya marriages, uh, where the partners were much, much more equal, is something that uh, comes up in different forms in um, yeah, different constellations. And one, other, uh, one thing where we will see that again is next week. Next week is our last session, and next week we are talking about Tulananda. And Tulananda is the epitome of a bad nun. She's the foremost in misbehavior in all Buddhist schools. And uh, the way that is seen most prominently is that she has a very bad relationship with Mahakasapa. And she also has a bad relationship with Bata Kapilani. And we are going to explore that much more in detail next week. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it is, uh, in one of the sources, it is said that she is uh, a Katya woman. And also from her behavior, the way her behavior is described is she's much more independent. She is very outspoken. Um, she is really someone who stands up to men also. And of course, if Mahakasapa as a Brahmin has a completely different idea of how women should behave, uh, that would make their relationship very difficult. Uh, and this is something we, which we'll explore more next week. So this whole idea of uh, there being very different conceptions between um, Brahmin women and Katya women is something that we will explore in detail next week. And, we will, and that might be one of the reasons why, um, why Tulananda was cast in this role as a very bad person uh, by the people who preserved the text in the beginning the followers of Mahakasapa, who were mainly Brahmins, who had mainly had that idea of uh, women who should be more submissive. And Tulananda didn't fit that mold at all. So this is something that will come up again next week. And in preparation for that, uh, Tulananda, because she's a misbehaving nun, mostly appears in Vinaya texts. So in preparation for that, we are also going to look at Bada Vinaya texts today, because as I mentioned, Tulananda and Bada also had a bad relationship. Um, so Bada is, Bada's appearance in the vinyas is very interesting and also her role is extremely different in the Pali vinya and in all the other vinyas. Um, so normally when nuns appear in the vinya, that means that they are misbehaving nuns. So the fact that Bada appears all over the vinya is not really a promising uh, thing. But in the Pali Vinaya, she has a very positive role, or at least she doesn't have a negative role. Um, so we're having, we having a look at that now and then compare with the non-Pali Vinaya. Uh, and uh, when we look at Vinaya, um, of course there are all the rules, but every rule has an origin story that explains 
how that rule was laid down, like the events that happened, how someone misbehaved or whatever happened, and then people complained, and the Buddha heard about it and, and laid down a rule. So from these origin stories, we can see a little bit about the social context in which those nuns lived and the expectations that lay people or other nuns had uh, about them and about their behavior. Um, so, first of all, we are now looking at uh, Pachitya rules. Pachitya rules are fairly minor rules. Um, and the first, the first one we're looking at is uh, 33 and 35. Uh, here we're not reading the entire origin story because this is one where Bada interacts with Tulananda. So we are looking into this more next time. But I just wanted to point out how Bada is described here. And it says, Vada Kapilani was a learned reciter who was confident and skilled at giving teachings, and she was respected for her excellence. Because of this, people visited Vada Kapilani. So this is Vada Kapilani's description in the Pali Vinaya. And here she is really an amazing, outstanding teacher. So she's described in very, very glowing terms. There's no hint of her being in any way a misbehaving nun. Um, but she does appear in other rules, and the way she appears is very interesting because it's so different from all the other schools. So Pachitya 11 says, At one time, when the Buddha was staying at Savati in another Pindika's monastery, a male relative of, the nun, of a nun who was a pupil of Bhatta Kapilani went from his own village to Savati on some business. Then in the dark of the night and without a lamp, that nun stood and talked alone with that man. The nuns of few desires complained and criticized her. How can a nun do such a thing? And then the rule is laid down. So here it's not Bada her herself who is misbehaving. It's actually a pupil of her who is hanging out with a man in the dark. And then the pupil obviously didn't get the message that she shouldn't hang out with a man. Because then uh, in the next rule, again, the same male relative comes uh, to Savati and the same nun who was a pupil of Bada Kapilani. Uh, while she, uh, knowing that the Buddha had prohibited standing or talking alone with a man in the dark of the night without a lamp, he instead stood and talked alone with that man in a concealed place. And then the rule is laid down, and then when she knew that the Buddha had prohibited standing or talking alone with a man in a concealed place, she instead stood and talked alone with that man out in the open. So one rule after another has to be laid down because that pupil of Bada Kapilani doesn't get the message that she shouldn't be alone with a man. Uh, but Bada Kapilani herself isn't really involved. She's just mentioned in the rule, uh, but she's not the one misbehaving. And then there is the Sangha Sesa. A Sangha Sesa obviously is a very serious rule. Um, and that same nun who was a pupil of Bada Kapilani had an argument with the nuns and then went to her relative's village. Not seeing her pupil anywhere, but a Kapilani asked the nuns, where's so-and-so? She's disappeared. She disappeared venerable after arguing with the nuns. My dears, her relatives live in such and such a village. Go there and look for her. The nuns went there and when they saw her, they said to her, why did you go alone, venerable? We hope you weren't assaulted. I wasn't. The nuns of few desires complained and criticized her. How can a nun walk to the next village by herself? Um, so again, uh, it's not Bada who's misbehaving, it's her pupil. And the way she's misbehaving is uh, that she is, um, the problem here is walking alone. But what we see overall in all these uh, Pachityas is that um, the nun is associating close, closely with lay people. Here in this case, she had an argument and the first thing is she does, she runs, runs back to her family. Um, and uh, also she's associating with men. So she seems to be very close to lay people still. And uh, she hasn't really properly gone forth in her mind yet. Uh, so she's not uh, that much separated from lay people and she's still mingling very much uh, with men and with uh, her relatives. Um, but Bada herself isn't involved in all that. She's just mentioned. And this is very different from the other schools. So now we are looking at the Mahasangika Vinya. And these are the same rules or very similar rules. But this time it is Bada herself, who is the one uh, who is the cause for the laying down of those rules. So uh, here the Buddha was staying at Vesali. 
Uh, and in all the non polyvinyls butter is very much associated with Vesali, not with Savati, as we've seen just now. And at that time, Bada Bikuni went to her relative's house and sat in a secluded place together with her brothers and sisters' sons. Uh, the Bikunis were upset and said, why does a renunciate sit with lay people in a hidden place like a lay person? And then the rule is laid down. And then uh, Bada doesn't get the message and Bada Bikuni went to her relative's house again and whispered in the ears of her brothers and sisters' sons while standing, standing within arm's reach. The slaves were upset and said, this renunciate whispers in their ears. Surely she speaks about our fault. So this time she, she uh, stands very close with those um, uh, lay people, with those male lay people, and she's whispering in their ears. And then uh, the next rule, Bada again goes to her relative's house. And when her brothers and sisters' sons were in a dark place without a lamp, she suddenly entered there without first an announcing herself. Then her relatives felt ashamed. So these are obvious parallels to the Pali rule. Uh, but this time it is Bada Bikuni who is misbehaving, not the pupil. So it's not too far-fetched to think that the Pali version was changed uh, in order to protect Bada's reputation and by extension then protect Mahakasapa's reputation because since the two are so closely interlinked, um, any misbehavior of Bada kind of falls back onto Kasapa and damages his reputation. Especially in a Brahmin context where the woman is supposed to be very submissive and supposed to be listening to the husband and the husband's supposed to have control over the woman. Um, so it's very interesting to see Bada in this role, in this misbehaving role, when she's a Brahmin woman and Mahakasapa is the one who's affected. And then we have a lot of rules that are very, very similar. Um, then Bada Bikuni rode in a nice high vehicle to go to her relative's house and the lay people were upset. Then Bada Bikuni went to her relative's house holding an umbrella and wearing leather sandals. Uh, then she went to her relative's house and climbed on a high-footed couch bed on which two or three layers of mats were spread out um, because that is uh, too, uh, very considered very luxurious. Uh, and then Bada Bikuni had gone to her relative's house again and saw that they were bathing. The women said to her, we will massage the venerable one's body and acquire some merit. The Bikuni was graceful and therefore the women wanted to see her body. She allowed them to massage it. Then they used all kinds of perfumes and oils and applied them on her body. The Bikunis were upset and said, this renunciate still has many wishes. So again, this is considered uh, way too luxurious. And then uh, the Buddha has laid down the precept again, uh, that it is not allowed to have lay women massage and wash a Bikuni. Then Bada Bikuni had another Bikuni massage her. And so she didn't, again, didn't get the message. First of all, she didn't get the message that she shouldn't stand around with laymen. Now she's not getting the message that she shouldn't uh, be massaged. So instead of a lay woman, now she has a bikuni massager. And then the Buddha lays on another rule and then she has a sikamana massager. And the Buddha lays on another rule and then she has a samaneri massager. So she really doesn't have that renunciate mindset here. And she's constantly socializing and hanging out with lay people and indulging in all these sense pleasures that were considered quite luxurious and quite outrageous for um, a renunciates to use. And of course, this is the way she is misbehaving is extremely interesting because this is in direct opposition to, uh, Maha, uh, to, to Maha Kasapa's foremost quality, being the most austere, the most ascetic monk. And she is the one who is completely indulging in all these sense pleasures and who is constantly hanging out with her relatives, constantly socializing with lay people. So this directly flies in the face of Mahakasapa's practice. Like if she was misbehaving in some other way, it wouldn't be that bad, but because she's misbehaving in this way, uh, it really undermines Mahakasapa's authority. So it's very interesting that this is portrayed in the non pali vinyas, while of course in the pali vinya it was changed um, to her pupil so that Kasapa's reputation could be um, preserved. Um, and then there's another story, Bada Bikuni put on a silk robe. So of course a silk robe again is quite luxurious. 
and went to her relative's house. On the road, she was caught in a rainstorm. The road became transparent like crystal and her whole body was visible. A crowd of people walked around her wanting to look at her. So she crouched down and the student depending on her stood at her, stood at her side to shield her off. So again, because she's indulging in this luxurious silk robe, <coughs> now she's getting in trouble. Um, and so, so far we have looked at the Mahasangika Vinaya. Now we are looking at some of the other Vinayas. And uh, we have so many stories. Uh, I'm not even showing you all the stories. We have much more stories. Uh, but uh, uh, for reasons of time, I'm going to summarize some of the stories that we are having here now. So this is from the Savasivada Vinaya. Uh, there's Bada, the Kapilan Brahmin woman. And her younger sister dies. So she, she visits the husband of the sister. And because it gets dark, she has to stay overnight. She doesn't dare to go back to the monastery anymore. Uh, so the husband has dubious intentions towards her because she stays overnight and he misunderstands her intentions. Uh, so um, nothing really happens. And the next morning she escapes, but it was a very close call. And then um, she gets criticized for spending the night alone with a layman. So again, she's in a late people's house and um, alone and too close uh, with a layman. And then we have uh, the Dharma Guptakas, Vinaya. Here we have two stories that are very similar. Mm. And here Bada Kapilani goes to her relative's house again. So in all the Vinayas, she's portrayed in exactly the same way. She's constantly in her relative's house. Uh, and here she guilt trips her relatives into giving her an extremely expensive cloth worth 100,000 panels of cotton cloth. Uh, and then they're very upset. This bikini takes without limit. Um, and she should, even if a supporter offers it, she should still know moderation. Um, so, and so this is a rule about uh, taking a heavy cloth. The next rule is exactly the same. Very, very similar origin story about taking a light cloth for the summer. So the, the first one is for the winter. The second one is for the summer. Um, and Bada, she's manipulating her relatives. She's guilt tripping her relatives uh, in order to get um, this really expensive cloth. And um, these rules appear in all of the vineyards and Bada is associated with this rule in several of the vineyards. Uh, in the Mahasangika vineyard, again, she is also the one who is the cause for laying down these rules. Mm. But the origin story is slightly different. Now I'm con I've confused myself. Ah, okay. So the origin story is slightly different. Um, there was a merchant who came from the north and he had a very expensive, uh, thick woolen, cl woolen cloth and he wanted to sell it, but it was way too expensive. Even the king couldn't afford it. So he got very depressed because he had made a big investment and couldn't sell the cloth. Then people advised him to go to Bada. Uh, and Bada, of course, um, um, Bada um, asked, how much do you want for it? And he said, I want 100,000. Then without bargaining, she said to a student, go and tell my relatives to take 100,000 and give it to him. Uh, and then the people asked, have you sold that woolen cloth or not? And he answered, I have sold it. And they asked who took it. And he answered the renunciant Bada. So here again, we see how much she is still involved with, with the lay people. He, she still thinks the lay people's money is her own money. And she can, she can make arrangements uh, for the money. And she can sort of buy stuff with her relative's money uh, as though she, she still were a lay person. So again, we see she doesn't have that mindset. And the next rule, so this rule was about the heavy cloth. The next rule is again the same about the light cloth. There's a merchant from the south. He had a thin cloth with a swan pattern. He also wants 100,000, it's too expensive for the king and Bada buys it in the end with her relative's money. Um, then there are different rules uh, here. There are two from Dhamma Guptaka and the Mahishafaka Vinaya. So these are about Bada again being too close with a man. Bada has a 
an abscess on her body. Uh, most vineyards stay on her thigh. Uh, and uh, without informing anyone, without having a second woman present, uh, she has a male doctor open it and treat it. And in one version, she, um, she gets attacked. Uh, in another version, she uh, doesn't get attacked, but the other bigonists fear that she might have gotten attacked. Um, so then they criticize her again for being alone with a man. So we see in all these vineyards, these are, are absolutely recurring topics over and over again, and I haven't even shown you all the rules. Uh, how Bada is way, way, way too close to men, way, way, way too close to lay people, how she really doesn't have a renunciate mindset. Um, and I think the story that summarizes that best is the one that I have put here in the bottom. And um, this one I'm going to read out in full. Uh, and this story says, the Buddha was staying at Parvati. At that time, a bhikkhuni, this is another bhikkhuni, not Bada. When the rains retreat at Savati had ended, came to Vesali and went to the house of the relatives of Bada Bikuni. Her family members asked, where did you spend the rains? She answered, at Savati. They asked, what is good and bad about Savati? The Bikuni said, Jaita's grove has abundant flower and flowers and fruit. The water in the ponds is pure and cool. The monastery is such and such. The world honored one's residence is such and such. The venerable Sariputta and Maha Moggallana are such and such. The household of Siddhartha, this is Anatta Pindika, is such and such. So she paints this glowing picture of monastic life in Savati. And the supporters, so this is Bada's relatives, said, This is true going forth. Now our Bada was born here and gets old here, like a person without hand and feet. From the outset, she refused to go out. So again, Bada, she, even though she's ordained, she's really like a, per, like a lay person, uh, not a renunciate mindset at all, hanging out with the relatives, not leaving the house. Um, so this is obviously very interesting what is happening here. Um, in all Buddhist traditions, um, including all these um, schools that have these kind of vineyards, um, there are stories preserved of Bada and Mahakasapa being a couple. So uh, in all the versions, this should have influenced or impacted on, on Mahakasapa. But the Pali version is the only version where Bada and uh, Kasapa's fate is intertwined in the same way that Buddha and Yashodara's fate was intertwined for many, many eons for thousands or millions of lifetimes in the past. In most or in all other traditions, or at least all other traditions where I've seen the text, um, this is not at all the case. Um, in most other traditions, Bada, uh, because she's foremost in remembering past lives, there are stories about her recollecting the past lives. And in all those past lives, Kasaba doesn't appear at all. So in all those stories, Kasaba happens to be her husband in the last life. But that's more or less a coincidence. So the links between Bada and Kasapa are much, much less strong in all the other traditions as compared to the Pali. So since Bada and Kasapa is more of a, like a coincidental reunion, it's not a marriage that was mandated by fate and that you know goes back through the eons. The um, influence that Bada could have on Mahakasapa is sort of much less in the other traditions than it is in the Pali. So in the Pali, it's much more necessary to portray her in a, bad, in a good light uh, because her links with Kaspar are so much more strong than they are in the non-Pali traditions. And I think this is one reason why Bada can be portrayed in that way in the non-Pali traditions as opposed um, to the Pali tradition. Um, and next time we will explore this whole topic of Vinaya a little bit more when we talk about uh, Tulananda. Um, and as I mentioned, Tulananda uh, is a very different character from Bada in some ways. In some ways, she's also similar. Um, but she has this completely opposite relationship with Mahakasapa, a very difficult relationship with Mahakasapa. Um, so I think that will be very interesting to explore next time.
um, and what we've done today is a little bit a preparation also to understand better what is happening next time. Um, so to sum up, um, in the early sources, Bada was a fairly uh, strong person who made a very strong claim uh, about her, her attainments uh, by using a, rhetoric, a rhetorical device uh, of praising Mahakasapa. And, <coughs> and she also made it very clear that she had a very genuine spiritual vocation, that she went forth because she saw the suffering in the world. And in her Abhadana text, that uh, praising of Mahakasapa was used in a way um, that her whole Abhadana started to focus only on Kasapa. And she was really relegated to a very, very submissive secondary um, position. So uh, um, her position changed very much from her early poem to her Abhadana text. And then in the vinyas, we, we see an, a completely different side of Bada again. So in the vinyas, it, it appears that she had very much trouble uh, with her spiritual vocation and that she was very, very attached to lay life. So um, it seems that uh, in the non Pali sources, she is depicted in a fairly or uh, substantially different way from the Pali sources, where she is this genuine uh, spiritual practitioner and also where her, her um, connection with Mahakasapa is much more strong and goes back many, many more lives. So um, unfortunately, we are a little bit, we are already out of time and we are not able to look at more texts from Bada. I just wanted to mention that there are also a lot of very beautiful stories about Bada in the Chinese text. Uh, there's also one uh, long uh, story or long sutta in the Kotada Agama that was translated by um, Bantanaleo, which is freely available on the internet, where she tells of a lot of her past lives where Mahakaspa does not play any role at all, where she's entirely independent. And especially there, she is a layman. And uh, that layman makes uh, a lot of merit with one of the past Buddhas. With the, in, with the express intention, with the aspiration to be reborn in a female body. So with the fruition of this meritorious act, uh, that layman becomes uh, a woman. Uh, and this is seen uh, as a fruition of, extremely, of that extremely good karma that he has made from serving that Buddha. So again, this is uh, uh, an instance where we see that uh, acquiring a female body can be a very, very meritorious karma. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't have the time to look in that, into that now, but if you want to read that, it's freely available on the internet. Um, I think the, uh, the text is called Karma and Female Rebirth uh, by Banta Analio. You can download it uh, and read it there. Very much recommended. And now if you have any questions or comments, then I will try my best to answer them. And I see Vanessa has um, typed in the chat. Uh, no problem. You can keep your video off. Not a big deal. So does anyone have a question? Yes, Anna-Marie? Hi, Aya. Thank you very much. Um, it seems that from what I've heard that um, when in, in past life stories, when people have relationships with each other, they always... Well, I don't know, this is the question, but do they always keep the same gender in relation to each other, like husband and wife, or like I read about Mahakasapa and Ananda in past lives, they were always like brother, grandson, father. So do they also switch genders in sometimes in previous lives? So um, from like what I know, um, there are stories about people switching gender, but if they, if the past life story is about a relationship, such as between Buddha and Yashodara, or between Mahakasapa and Bada, then usually they don't switch the gender. So in the Pali versions of those stories where they have these, um, you know, these marriages that go back a long time and where in every life they are to, to, together again, then they don't switch gender. 
But um, in Chinese sources where butter is independent, for example, or we have seen um, last time there was Bada Kachana, who is another, who might be uh, another name for, for Yashodara. Uh, when they are alone, there are many stories where people switch gender. Uh, we even have stories of the Buddha being a female in a past life. Um, but if the whole point of the story is to show that they are an ideal couple that formed their relationship over many, many lifetimes, then I, I have not heard of any story where they did actually switch gender. Any other question? Okay, if there's no other question, then um, we can finish for today. Next time we are talking about Tulananda. Next time will also be our last session. Um, and if you have the time, I really highly recommend that you check out um, Karma and Female Rebirth from Bantanalio and you read that story because I think it's really very interesting and it's uh, such a pity that we didn't have the time to read it today. I love that story very much. So highly recommend it. Um, and for today, we can finish with three sadhus as usual. Feel free to join me if you'd like. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And I'll see you all next time. Thank you. That was good. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed. <laughs>